Mustafa, it's so nice to have you here, man. It's about about time. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. Thank you uh, for having me. Congrats on the Juno. Thank you. How are you feeling about that? Um, I feel great about it. You know, it's like, it's a thing that comes in waves, you know, the way that I feel about it, you know, if that makes any sense. What do you mean? Like, I mean, uh, the joy comes in waves, you know, and then yeah. it's like, uh, and then in other times I, I think about what it actually means at all, you know, and like, you know, just being the, like I spoke on the stage, of course, about being the first to win it. You know what I mean? As like a Muslim and how I don't believe being the first of anything is a thing that should be celebrated. It should be a critique. It should be critiqued more. And so I think that maybe I feel an imposter syndrome yeah. sometimes about whether I'm deserving of this particular space, you know, and, uh, but it feels wonderful. Like, I'm just glad I was able to do it for my community and for this record in particular. Tell um, me now, if you were to choose one word to summarize what the past year has been like for you now, what would it be? One word is difficult. Give me two then. A year of precision and sacrifice. Tell me about precision. It's a year of precision because I feel as though this may be the first year in my life where I was very intentional about the decisions that I was making around the record, around where I wanted to be, around the spaces that I wanted to occupy. And before I just used to kind of float wherever, you know, the wind would take me. And I love being that way as well. I think that's why I became an artist is because I love the kind of the spontaneous nature of artistry and traveling. Uh, but I, but I guess sacrifice and precision comes hand in hand because I think I sacrificed a lot of opportunities and a lot of situations for my own mental health and for the precision um, that I wanted to honor, you know what I mean? Both in my career and in my personal life. And uh, yeah, I think I'm, I'm glad that I, I, I did that and I followed through. Because it, it's an interesting journey, right? Because, I mean, you, you've had a presence, like a public presence for a long time now, you know? Like, you've been in the public eye as a poet ever since you were a little kid, which is yeah. something that a lot of artists at your stature haven't had to navigate. How did those early day years, or did those early years, prepare you for what you've been dealing with these days? Like, um, in some ways, I developed tools to be able to, you know, engage in the battles that I'm engaging with now. But there's nothing that can prepare you really for the year following or the year past. And I think what I was dealing with when I was younger, then I would have imagined that I would be, I would have been prepared for everything I'm dealing with now. Yeah. But, you know, it's just like I'm, I'm in it. It's the way in which we're able to normalize a situation and then like become increasingly, you know, uncomfortable with the situation so quickly, I think always changes the way in which I gauge anything, you know? So like five years ago, uh, you know, loss, I, I could have been numb to the losses that I was experiencing. And now I could be feeling it in a way that I never even felt it when it was happening. And so, I don't know, it's, it, it's an odd thing, but like, I, I definitely feel like I had the wisdom of, of lived experience and if not my experience and experiences of other people, you know? And I think that, uh, that more than even my own experience, I was watching the way in which my community dealt with so much. And I think that that became my reference point and, and that became the blueprint of how I dealt with what I was dealing with, you know, yeah, yeah. if that makes any sense. Is, it, would the attention, like would the ability to, to handle attention be easier because you've been handling attention for a long time? Again, the attention looks you know, is, is like, is incredibly different than it was before. Yeah. But absolutely. I think I, I grew up in a community where over 70 languages were spoken. I would walk out of my house on Regent Street and I would greet about 10 people before I reached the corner store or before I reached the mosque or before I reached my school. It was like, you know, kind of that, that like we had like this rigorous sense of camaraderie and it was beautiful and overwhelming and I think it sharpened my ability to to speak and to interact with people. Like, if there's one thing that I also took from like being in 
St. John and Newfoundland is that people are really well spoken, you know? Yeah. It's like, that's the one thing. Like everyone there barely stumbled on their words. It's like they were like incredibly articulate. And we I think, love to talk. We love to chat. Exactly. And I guess that it's like if, you, if you've been chatting since you were young, it's like, you know, you kind of develop an, an ability in that. And I think that having to interact with so many different kinds of people and different kinds of characters from when I was young definitely kind of prepared me for even a conversation like this. Not to say that I think I'm at like, you know, I've, I've mastered my ability at like, you know, interaction, <laughs> but, um, I think every single day I'm closer. Yeah. You know? And we are nothing, but if not the sum of our own experiences. Exactly. Speaking of, can I get you to put the headphones on for clip, clip number one? Yes, absolutely. You, you got them there? It's taking me a second to get mine. All right. So pop them on for me. So this is, um, I want to go back to April 1st, 2008. Can you hear it? Uh, a poetry night put on together by the Muslim Student Society here in Toronto. Take a listen. I will start by saying hi, hello, and my salutes. To my audience, please keep it down to a mute. People at the back, I hope I'm pretty loud. And yo, you back there, can you get in the crowd? <laughs> Listen, I ain't here to be line spitting. I'm going to tell you the truth, and that's my real mission. And if you don't want to hear it, it's all right, you're forgiven. See, I used to be seven, but now I'm 11. And I'm hoping that with increasing age, ears that actually listen, surround me. Is that is Mustafa that performing a spoken word piece <laughs> called A Single Veil. It was one of the first pieces to get you significant attention. You were 11 years old. Wow. What do you hear when you listen to that now? You know, I have a difficult time hearing my own voice. And that may have been my first time hearing myself at 11 in years. Yeah. But it was easier to listen to myself at 11 than it is for me to listen to myself at 25. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I envy Mustafa at 11 years old because he didn't know, you know, and I think there's something about being unaware that and being naive that allows for you to move through things with true grace and with true wonder. Yeah. And I'm always trying to chase that wonder when I'm in the studio, when I'm writing, when I'm recording. Um, enthusiasm is like fuel you know and to be enthusiastic you have to be a touch naive yeah and i think i, I had that naivety when i was young and this is also mustafa before loss you know yeah. and before the grief and before the internal turmoil in his community and before realizing the way in which people outside of the community viewed the community yeah and so i guess when i hear him i'm hearing like, you know, a voice that was not kind of altered or distorted by all the systems that have, I guess, deepened my voice to the place that it's at now, along with uh, puberty, of course. But. Yeah, right. It's, it, sounds, it sounds like you love love that person that you're listening Absolutely. to. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I read something somewhere that, like, the person that you are now is the person that you would have needed when you were eight years old. Yeah. And when I read that, I'm like, oh, it was like, uh, it was simple, but it struck me because I was like, it's true, you know? And I, and I realized that I'm slowly becoming the person that I would have needed in that time. And that person was not present, you know? Uh, but yeah, it's, it's really incredible to hear. I actually never, I realized that I don't listen to myself at all. I don't listen to records once they come out in the world. I don't watch performances yeah. once I've, you know, completed them. Are you self-critical or are you just... Too critical of myself. And I think that I already am like, you know, jotting internal notes of what I'm doing wrong as I'm performing. And so I don't need to, you know, kind of enter this kind of like a space where I'm like, almost like, you know, just hurting, hurting myself by yeah. like repeatedly listening and engaging with that. Also, there's like a this level of escapism there that I need to address for myself, you know, uh, because I think if I open myself up to the world of horror, even that I, that is like kind of right next to me, you know what I'm saying? It's almost like there's like a barrier separating myself from like all of the, like, you know, horrific realities that I am, more or less attached to by way of my lived experience, 
then it's it's like Pandora's box, you know? Yeah. And so for my own stability, I just have to be very careful about what it is I choose to channel, what it is I choose to open to myself. You know, I think that like I it like even like writing the records that I wrote, um, I had to pace myself, you know, I had to pace myself. There were some songs that were incredibly yeah. difficult to write and some questions that I never asked before, questions that nobody um, dares to ask because they want to survive it, and rightfully so. There are people in my community that don't listen to anything that I do. Yeah. You know, people that are close to me, close to the people that we lost, they don't listen to any of the songs that I write. Um, some don't even attend the performances, and I can't blame them for it. Why? Because they may not have the resources that I have to deal with that grief and that trauma once it's opened up. Yeah. I think I needed, I couldn't write these songs in Toronto. It was impossible because of how, how was I to write um, about loss in the place where I was experiencing the war? And so I had to, leave Toronto and I was in London and I was writing those songs from London. I think being on the outside, I was given that balance and I was given that opportunity and that space to be able to write those songs. And uh, because of the little success that I had, yeah. I was able to have the tools to speak to people and to travel the world and to free myself of the situation and understand what it was doing to my body and to my heart and to my mind. And a lot of my community was not offered that. Yeah. And so I, I accept wholeheartedly the reasons that they can't engage with the work that I do. And I can even accept sometimes the people that resent it in a way as well. Is, does that does that happen? Absolutely. And I think that that was a thing that I didn't anticipate when I was writing these songs was that people in my own community were going to uh, be against, like, you know, my telling of these stories. Yeah. And I thought because it was such a personalized experience of mourning with people that I lost that were in my life. Cause we lost a lot of people in Regent park, you know, yeah. and I felt all of them. I felt all those losses. I even felt the losses of the people that I didn't know because they were in my community. Yeah. But there's this hierarchy in grieving who gets to grieve at what capacity do they get to mourn someone? Yeah. How much do they get? how much and what are the borders of you know of that allowance and like when does that celebration end and when does it begin and for which people is that celebration boundless and for which people is that celebration restricted and those are things i had to think about always when i was younger i remember being 13 years old and writing on facebook about someone that we lost in the community and people in my school were speaking about how I, I was trying to, people in my school were talking about how I was trying to get attention. Capitalize. Or, and capitalize yeah. on that. I think that, I mean, it takes me so long to say that because it's like, it's still a thing that like I struggle with because I'm like, oh, I was 13, you know? Yeah. And to be 13 years old and to not even have an opportunity to explore what, a murder in your community is doing to you. Yeah. Two years older than that kid we heard. Two years older. And I, and, and you know, and I was just, I was only just trying to make sense of it, you know, and I was trying to find the words for it. And of course the words were flawed and they were probably contradictory and there were many other things, but I was 13. Yeah. And we speak a lot about how, you know, young people of color, young black children and, inner city communities are not granted childhood or youth, you know, like youth is taken away from them. There was an article that was published about a three-year-old that um, passed when he stepped out of his home in the dead middle of the winter. Right. And there were headlines that were referring to him as a young man. Yeah. 
And I think that that opened a lot of conversations about the way in which people view, like, you know, young black boys and young black girls. And I also have to take into account the way in which community members do that to each other. You know, we were only 13 years old and stripping that youth and that vulnerability from each other, you know? And of course, that's a result of the systems that we were in. But uh, yeah, I guess that never ended. And you spoke earlier to me about how much I was prepared for this. And I guess in some ways, I, I did have all these conversations before. And perhaps I'm just a little better at navigating them because before I was like completely alien to what that was and what that meant. And I just kind of surrendered to whatever anybody had to say. Like I remember taking down those Facebook posts about the people that the, the person that passed away. Because you were so affected by that. I was yeah, incredibly yeah, affected yeah, yeah. by it. So I was like really careful about who I chose to grieve and how much I chose to grieve them publicly or otherwise. Can, can I have a couple of questions on what you just said there. Mm -hmm. One is, um, where does poetry fit into this? Because poetry is an interesting way to talk about grief. It's an interesting way to talk about things you've gone through. It's an interesting way to talk about the things that you've seen. Mm -hmm. what, like your sister is the one who got you into poetry? Yeah, and I think I, my sister used to write poetry herself and and I was getting into a lot of trouble when I was younger. I was uh, I was fighting a lot. Um, I was I was passionate, you know. Like, and I think with that passion uh, came a lot of disappointment from my parents or from my family. And instead of writing lines, she would force me to write poetry to try to explain what it is that I was experiencing. And I guess when she grant she gave me that book, I remember it was a blue book. When she gave me that book, and I. And I began writing in it, I was forming my own voice without even realizing it. And that book and those pages became as important to me as the ears of my mother and father, you know, that it was like, it was so important for me to communicate to those pages what I was experiencing. And I didn't understand then why it was, but it became like a figure in my life in a lot of ways. And, 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 and it mattered, like what I said mattered in those pages, even if they were for nobody else but myself. And I loved so much the idea of having my own universe. Yeah. You wouldn't share it. You wouldn't. Most of the pieces I didn't share yeah. from when I was 12 and Poetry granted me the ability to have my own world. And being in a hood where you have no corner to claim as your own, every basketball court, every park, every bedroom and living room in my household um, was occupied. And there was a presence there before I entered it. And I couldn't be there for more. I couldn't be anywhere for more than 30 seconds without someone entering a room. Like there was no space that was my own. And, and I think that that's why people choose the night. You know, they choose the night because the night is the time in which they can be alone, the time in which they can explore thoughts yeah. and patterns without critique and without having to pander to someone else. And, I guess when I had that book and having poetry was the way in which I escaped my friends and I escaped my community and I escaped my parents and I escaped all of uh, the expectations of what I was supposed to be and who I was supposed to be. I loved speaking to my friends and telling them that I was going to go write poetry or that I was like, you know, going to watch someone perform poetry. And I loved how confused they were and that like confusion was was my escape, you know? It was the way in which I was able to separate myself from the rest of the world because it wasn't a thing that anyone cared about but myself. And so I felt like I had 
my own relationship with it. Did you did you realize you had an affinity for it? Did you realize you were good at it? You, you no, you know? no, I didn't think I was good at it at all because I was I was like twelve years old, but also reading um, the poetry of like Hafiz or like Rumi and and watching people like Amir Suleiman, who was like you know one of the Def Jam poets, watching him and Mos Def perform, and. And I, from that age, imagined that I was supposed to be writing poetry like them. Ah, yeah. Which is, you know, which is ridiculous. And I guess no one was present to tell me that, you know, they were like three times my age. Yeah. You know? But you kind of need that. You kind of <laughs> need to, you know, you kind of need to have that model in order to. For you sure. You kind of got to think you're that good. You kind of got to think you got to be that good to get better. For sure. But I think at 12. Yeah. I just didn't have... <laughs> yeah, you're 12. All yeah, I was just yeah. 12 and yeah. I didn't have enough lived experience for like, you know, it was like, I think that disparity was so large yeah. that it wasn't even beneficial to me. Okay. I think now, or like even from the point I was seven, 16, 17 years old, looking at someone that's beyond me was was really important and really critical to my growth. But at 12 years old, I just needed to live. You know, I just needed to go out and, you know play sports and and actually fight and actually be confused and and understand why I was being suspended whether it was in school or at home and 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 I think that I did that in a lot of ways but so much of my anxiety came from thinking I wasn't worthy of the title of a poet you know and uh which is so funny up until I was like 16 and I always thought that people would stop caring the moment I was 16 or 17 or 18 that you weren't this kid poet anymore I, that I wasn't the young poet because because I ended up subscribing to you know the shock of the audience yeah which wasn't why I began writing who's this I, kid oh my god look at this but kid. like receiving like kind of that shock from like people realizing my age you know and and, and then wanting to stay there stay in that age stay yeah. in that shock and stay in that celebration and i think it was it was difficult for me because people weren't thinking of what i was actually saying you know and i think that i wanted that to be priority you know and i wanted that to be mentioned to me when i got off a stage or when someone was discussing my work that my age wasn't the thing that was at the forefront and in a lot of ways i think i battle with uh, a thing that is similar to that now maybe it's not age but maybe it's experience that i'm like i want people to also look at uh, me as like you know as like a canadian songwriter you know but also not a person that is just uh ex you know just went through like a world of hell and is just trying to like you know spell it out in song you know that, that i i wrote songs for so many years prior to writing my own and uh i think the practice and the and the practice of songwriting is a is one that is incredibly important to me I think that the urge to not be compartmentalized and the urge to not be, not to have someone else tell your story for you yeah. is not just a big part of your own story, the, the one you just told me, but it also like in some ways the story of this record. You know, one of the things you first, when you first sat down and we started chatting, you said, you know, I looked at not just my community, but how the media was talking about my community. Yeah. I looked at, you know, children who were three, three years old outside freezing to death who were called, you know, young black man yeah. freezes to death. And I, I wanted to talk about in the, that in the context of, of the record just a little bit, but I want to be clear about how I want to talk about it. So yeah. the, the album is When Smoke Rises. The, the title is a dedication to my guest, Mustafa's friend and rising artist in his own right, Smoke Dog, who was murdered in 2018. Listen, if it's all the same to you, this is what I'd like to know. Like, what's your earliest memory of him? I know that my, um, my earliest memory of Smoke Dog is being... 12 years old and I was attending Regent Park Duke of York which is a school that is no longer and he was in Nelson Mandela Park Public School which is the school that I was going to later transfer to nearby walking distance yeah and so during a lunch break I walked over to the schoolyard the Nelson Mandela schoolyard and I seen him for the first time. I remember I had ice cream in my hand. I had like a little vanilla, 
little bowl of vanilla ice cream that they were giving out for free somehow. They don't ever do that. Yeah, the little Dixie cup with the with the wooden spoon. Yeah, but that, yeah, 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 yeah. The Dixie cup with the wooden spoon. Yeah. Like I mean, that was the first time that that happened in the school, so it was a big deal. I don't even know what happened for <laughs> us to receive that. Yeah, but I knew who Smoke Dog was prior, like Hamuk, because he came from a really popular family. You know, like this, his family was like the glory of like Regent Park in a lot of ways. Um, his father and mother and his siblings who were like really popular kids, you know, like his older brothers were, were really popular. And so I was like, oh, this is Smoke Dog. Like he's like the younger brother of like J-Dog and Ace. And and so we met right there in that uh, schoolyard. He was really kind. He, was, he had like this great sense of calm to him. Like, you know, you know, like nonchalance is such a critical part of being cool. Yeah. And I was not nonchalant. I, I was I've, too emotional. I've never mastered the nonchalant. No, no, I could never do it. I was way yeah. too. I was way too emotional. Way too. <laughs> emotional, but like I was like always on like. A, and I also had no boundaries. Unfortunately, you know, like boundaries is an important part of nonchalance yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I never <laughs> learned where people got boundaries from, but I personally could not find them. <laughs> and so, I remember meeting him, and he had he had it all. He had the boundaries. He had the nonchalance, and he was kind also with it. And I think that when you have all of the properties of being cool. And then you could still be generous with like the way you interact with someone. It's like, that's all the charm that a young kid or a young adult needs in this life. And yeah, I think that stayed with me and I would continually go to that schoolyard and our friendship slowly built. And then when I was in grade seven, when I was 13, I transferred to Nelson Mandela and uh, we were uh, spending a lot of time together because we were like, you know, in the same grade, kind of growing together. There was even a time where him, myself, and another friend of ours, we all broke our hands. How? <laughs> so it was, it was him, myself, and another actually rapper named Moji from our community. And we just came to school one morning and all of us had broken wrists just ran, uh, separately separately separate situations separate occasions yeah. and somehow <laughs> all on the all in the same evening and uh, i think i broke my wrist playing basketball our friend broke his wrist falling down and smoke dog broke his wrist playing basketball as well and then we just, yeah, we all came to school the following day All right. Uh, with, uh, with casts. It was, I mean, yeah, I don't know why, but I really, I remember that. I thought it was hilarious. It was so ridiculous. And then I guess, yeah, from there, like, I went to, we went to different high schools. I went to Jarvis Collegiate. Yeah. And he went to Eastern. And so, like, you know, we weren't seeing each other as often, but we were, like, still in the same community. So we'd always see each other in Regent Park. And then as he started to develop as a rapper and I started to move closer into songwriting, we started spending a lot of time together, you know, and uh, traveling together every now and again and going to the studio for like, you know, hours on end. And I would just kind of watch him record music and I would sit in my own world contemplating who I wanted to be and what I wanted to be. And, and if there's one thing I'm really grateful for is that I was patient, you know, like I was like, I never, I never actually had like, of course I was eager, but like I understood that for me to arrive at my own expression, it would take time. And if, especially if I want to develop my own sonic identity, the way that I was able to develop my identity as a poet when I was in the hood, I was like, I need to do the same thing with music, you know? Yeah. And I was always very afraid of losing my voice in a choir of other people. But with Smoke Dog, we never argued. I don't. In our entire friendship, I don't like. When we were really young. We were probably thirteen, fourteen. There were arguments, but like from the point that we were like seventeen, eighteen years old, like we had such a great respect for each other yeah. that we never used to discuss hood politics with each other. Yeah. So anybody that died, you know, who hated who, and you know, who committed what murder, like that, those conversations never happened. We only spoke about our careers and our dreams and our families. And uh, and I think that in a lot of ways, we knew that we had to have those discussions with other people. But without saying it, we decided that we were just not going to have that conversation oh, with each wow. other. 
Even if our own brothers were involved in some sort of turmoil, we never discussed that with each other. It was almost like we were like protecting the nature of our relationship. And I know that it was so sacred because only a week before he passed, there was something that I was holding against him. And I gave him hyper dunks, which are these like uh, the Nike hyper dunks. I, I basically sold it to him. Like someone, someone gave it, gifted it to me when I was really young, but they were like two sizes smaller. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't wear them. So Smoke Doc said he wanted to buy them from me and said he, he said to give me $35 for them. Mm. And so I gave him the shoes, but he never gave me the money. And I asked twice, but I guess I was too shy to ask a third time. Yeah. And he was speaking about how, like, you know, you know, his family was going through a difficult period, you know what I mean, in that time when you were 13 or 14 years old. And, and so I guess even two weeks before, we just, we started to discuss all of the things that, you know, we tucked away, you know what I mean? Oh. Some of the conversations that were buried, some of that, you know, some of the inconsistencies in our relationship, however small they were, you know, however nuanced they were, it just like the important thing is that we were mentioning. And I don't know why we chose that evening yeah. to do so, yeah. but we did. And I mentioned the hyperdunks to him as well. I said, I suppose those hyperdunks and you never gave me the money. He's like, I'm so sorry. I didn't even realize and this is 10 years later. And we were laughing and uh, he's like, oh, I'll give you the money right now. I was like, no, I don't need it. But he's like, yo, do you forgive me? I'm like, of course I forgive you. I'm like, you know, and like, and I, I said, and I hope you forgive me for for anything if I've ever wronged you. And, you know, to think that he passed only you know, only a few weeks after that conversation is, uh, like I said, a testament to his spirit. Like, you know, he, it, like he was like ties that were severed, he was mending prior to his passing as well. So he had like, you know, this like really gentle, beautiful nature. And in Islam, we believe that like the soul is aware when it's uh, nearing its end. Mm. And so even the patterns of someone's patterns begin to change uh, closer to their death. And if those, um, if those patterns are gent more gentle and they're more kind and, and, uh, and they're even like a little more joyous, then it's a good sign, you know? And I think that, um, yeah, his, his end, although, you know, thinking about the way in which he died being, uh, probably like you know maybe perhaps the worst way to pass is for someone to take your life but you know i think that that is uh it's a technicality to the spirit you know because i would think about someone's soul i think about someone's spirit all i could think about is uh is the costume of a body that we're given and uh the journey is so much greater than that you know and so i think that you want to think about his journey, yeah. you know, and the time in which he passed, it, that was written, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I, it, it's beautiful. Like, I, th I realized that he's, like, so multifaceted. Like, you know, it's like the world and the universe of someone like him and other people that I lost. Um, they arrive to me differently every now and again. Like, this is probably my first time exploring that part of our relationship or, you know, the days leading up to his passing. But, yeah. A, a tremendous amount of love is what I'm hearing. Absolutely. Did you, um, I, Your performance at the Junos, mm -hmm. I mean, I think you know why I bring that up, you know. You performed uh, Stay Alive with your buddies. Absolutely. I, I saw you afterwards at the after party. I didn't want to come over and say hello. You oh. were in it. You were in it. So I didn't <laughs> want to. But I said a quick hello and like, not at all. Yeah. But... Talk to me a little bit about um, what that meant for you to have that performance. I could tell it isn't from your Instagram presence afterwards. Well, actually, you know what? For people who haven't seen, maybe we should set up what it was. Can you do that for me? Absolutely. Like, I mean, I had about 16 of my friends on stage with me as I was performing the bridge of Stay Alive. They surrounded me. They came from out from both sides of the stage and surrounded me and then they sang the last chorus of Stay Alive alongside me. And it meant so much to me because these are guys that are hidden, you know, hidden 
in so many ways, it's like, it meant so much to me because my community is just not given that platform. And all the priority neighborhoods in this city are rarely given platforms like the Junos and like any other stage in Toronto and in this country. You know, like I, I think about the amount of people that have passed, the amount of rappers that have passed in Toronto from different inner city communities. And I think about how there was never a tribute for them at any music event in Toronto or in any other province in this yeah, in country. Canada, right across, yeah. And I think it's because their deaths are not recognized because their lives are not recognized either. And it's so important for me to continually remind our nation, our city, and our platforms that they exist yeah. and that they're here and that we are here as a community. And I think that I'm like perhaps a more palpable, you know what I mean? Digestible version of what a Regent Park resident looks and feels like, mm. but I don't want to be digestible. I don't want to be palpable. I don't want to be, you know, acceptable by, you know, the boundaries set by like white systems that have not recognized me in my youth, that have not recognized 11 year old Mustafa that was trying to understand himself like there was no space for him. Mm. And it's so important that we continually involve communities like Regent Park in the conversation because only in bringing them in the conversation will they feel like they're a part of one, you know? A lot of my friends didn't feel like they should be there because it didn't make sense to them that they, they were... They didn't feel like they should be there that night? They didn't feel like they should be there. They didn't feel like they should be a part of the performance because they, it was such an abstract thing to them. Yeah. The idea of the Junos, the idea of any stage funded by the government of Canada, yeah. you know? And of course it makes a lot of sense because there was never any connection drawn between my community and any stage in Canada and any stage in Toronto. And, and, and I realized in that moment that it's just, it's, it's just paramount, you know, like it's of paramount importance. Like I, like Regent Park is the largest housing project in Canada. Yeah. It's the most, it's of the most populated communities in Canada. Yeah. And the only time that people really engage with people in Regent Park is when they want the Regent Park vote because yeah. it's such an important vote. Yeah. And so some of the most important ministers in our country have engaged with the community for that very reason. But beyond that, it's so important for communities like Regent Park and like Rexdale. And I had my friends from Rexdale on that stage as well because it wasn't just about my community, but it was about communities like mine, you know, all hoods in Toronto and all hoods in Canada. And it was beautiful because I had friends on that stage that just came home from doing five years in prison. They've just been home for six, six months. Some of them wrongfully convicted and released. And just seeing how they felt after being on that stage was so important to me. It was like medicine. Like they, how'd they feel? They felt important, you know, and they felt worthy of not just being on that stage, but living and like having dreams and having aspirations. And there were conversations I was having with my friends after that performance that I'd never had with them prior to that. Really? They were just speaking about what they wanted to do, clothing lines that they wanted to start, things that they wanted to be a part of, all because, you know, the Junos team dealt with them respectfully and because they performed and they watched a city that they did not believe cared about them, celebrate them and stand for them and cheer for them and cry for them. And they, they were confused as to whether or not they were deserving of that, but they were because they were there and they were, and they were in it. And, and I realized in that moment that it was, that that was just kind of a microcosm for the way in which so much could exist in this country, that that stage is a metaphor for visibility, you know, and like what, are the ways that we are making guys like them and community members like 
the ones from Regent Park visible, you know, and and how that visibility and, and of course the right visibility, because there's of course a lot of ways that they are visible, but that visibility has been destructive to yeah, them. Yeah, we just talked about that. The the the, the how the, how the visibility can be misconstrued, or sorry, you know, can be portrayed in racist media ways. Exactly, yeah, exactly. and yeah. so it's like you know, I think about how policing systems, um, you know, make guys like the ones that were on stage with me hyper visible in a way that's destructive to them and their families yeah. like all of our homes have been raided you know and and the thing is it's so much easier to raid a home that is in a housing project you know it's so much easier for someone to get like you know the rights to for police officers and to, for different divisions to get rights to raid homes that are not owned or rented without the assistance of the government you know it's like they're continually reminding us that what we have is not ours, that this community is not ours, that the living room that we are sitting in is not ours, and that the healthcare system was not built or made for us. Like every single system that we've had to engage with, you know, whether it's the system that de deals with death, the system that deals with care, the system that deals with livelihood, all of those systems make it deeply clear that they were not made for us. And moments like the one on that Juno stage just for us is important because it's like a, it's a reminder to firstly the community that the city is ours in a lot of ways as well and that we are deserving of all the things that are trying to be taken from us, you know? And of course, in a lot of ways, it's just like, it's a corporation, you know what I mean? And this is just, you know, this is really just like a corporate partnership and, you know, the awarding system in itself is flawed because, you know, music is music and expression uh, yeah. can't like, you know, be solidified by any stage or by any award, but I'll take every opportunity that I can and I'll take every moment that will be made for me to celebrate my community, you know? Yeah. And had it, had it not been for the opportunity to bring all my friends on stage, I wouldn't have performed. Yeah. You know, that wasn't like, I just like, in the beginning, I, I told my manager, I'm like, if I can bring my community on stage with me, I'll perform. Mm. And in the beginning, and they only wanted me to bring four people on stage or five people on stage. And I'm like, no, I'm like, I, I'm gonna need a classroom of people on stage yeah. with me. <laughs> and so, yeah, I was really happy about it. And I just hope that like, I could just use whatever that uh, adrenaline is to like, you know, just better the situations of my friends mm -hmm. and to continue to create spaces like that one on our own where we can feel like that, you know, without like kind of like having to relish in like the adoration of, of 15,000 person crowd, yeah. you know? Yeah. How do they, do they, I heard you say something really interesting one time in, in an interview about like about your record, about your friends in your record, yeah. where you said something like, I'm trying to remember what the quote is, but something along the lines of like, well, they would listen to it and they would kind of go like, where's the beat? They, they would, they would still try to yeah. like the music because, because like, do you, I didn't like, is folk, folk music. Can we yeah. say it? Yeah. You identify as a folk, folk artist. Like is, um, well, talk to me about that. Like, I guess like. Not being a folk artist, but about no, like no, uh, for for sure, like like it's so calculated the dreams that have been written for people in communities like mine. Okay, you know it's not by chance that you know everyone wants to become drill rappers or basketball players and. And it's not by chance that they sometimes can't see outside of those particular aspirations. And for a lot of my friends, that's what it was. Like the only way for them to transcend the community was either through rap or through sports. And, and of course, like, you know, I love rap so much. And in a lot of ways, I think drill is an important, uh, depiction of what's happening in communities like mine but what i've always advocated for and what i always found important was being able to create more pathways for people to dream in uh in my life because even for myself i didn't feel like i was deserving of this path of being a songwriter of being a poet of 
of like identifying as a folk artist. And I think it's, I think genres in itself, they're like constructs that shouldn't exist. Yeah. But I think, you know, my effort of like the, of calling myself a folk artist is just to break away from all of like, you know, the boxes that people are continually trying to like, you know, place me in. And it's important because I want other people in my community to see me walk into a world that was not made for me, especially not in this nation, you know? And so when they're confused about the songs that I'm writing and like we're shooting a video and one of my friends goes, like, yeah, like, like what's, you know, where's the beat? Like, when's like, you know, are you, are you going to finish the song? Cause like in his mind, he's like, yo, this isn't like, you know, yeah. where are the 808s? Like, where is like, you know, the heavy bass line? Like, where's like, it's like, and he understands music to exist in a certain way. And I was really happy about that because I'm like, no, I'm going to show you that like, it can be bereft of all of those, you know, all those instruments and still be a powerful song. And for some of them, it took them, months before they realized what it is that I was actually doing or what it is that I was actually saying in the songs. Like I'd have friends call me months after a song came out and they'd be like, wow, like I just like, you know, listen to the lyrics. Like my boy's like, I just got high and I was listening to your song and I was like, damn, like it's crazy what you're saying in the song. And I'm like, he not only was he in the video, but he's been, <laughs> he's must have heard it at least a yeah. hundred times. You <laughs> he's know? finally, finally picked yeah, it out. Like, yeah. I'm like, okay, great. I'm like, but it's true that, music takes time to arrive to us, yeah. you know? So it's like, it may take a period of time before someone is able to really understand the contents of what it is that I'm saying, especially when I'm speaking directly to them. It's difficult. Like at the end of the day, like I was talking about the Kendrick album to a friend of mine and, and I was trying to reconcile with why it was difficult for people like in my community to listen to the Kendrick record because it was written for them in a lot of ways. The new Kendrick record. The new Kendrick record. Yeah. And, a, and a lot of Kendrick records. Yeah. Like, you know, like those albums are like, I don't see them circulating in my community. And, I, and it's because he is pointing at the thing that they are trying to escape. And so for a lot of them that are still in it, listening to Kendrick feels like... Um, isolating but i think it's so important that it exists because eventually they'll arrive at a place where they can engage with it in a different context or in a different capacity but it's important that that i write songs like this and even if some of my friends can't understand it now as they as they fight for their lives and their and their right to live and their right to dream and their right to have families as they fight for those rights. And inshallah, as they begin to acquire some of those rights, they'll be able to hear those songs differently and that'll always exist for them as a reference point and as an emotional and as a memory of the grief that we experienced you know, that I was taking a photograph of what that emotion was and it'll always be held for them, even if they couldn't experience it now because they were in a state of survival, they'll have it for another time where they are prepared to grieve, where they are prepared to mourn. That I'm like, you know, I'm always, I'm almost just like preserving this account of grief for them, you know, because I created it because my own experience of loss was stripped from me and so i had to rewrite it and so now that i've rewritten what that experience was i'm going to hold it for them and it'll be there for them whenever they need it even if they come to me five years from now ten years from now it'll be there and and this and, and i i'm truly like in full respect and adoration of the songwriters that have come before me in this country like you know the, like the like the abundance of wealth that we've uh, we've been given is like we have an embarrassment of riches neil young and Joni and leonard and even dallas green like there's so many different songwriters that have written such harrowing beautiful and brave songs and my hope is to be able to write about my community the way that Neil was able to write about his. Like I think about songs like um, Needle and the Damage Done 
And that could have been written about Regent Park, you know? Like, and I was like, and that's a song that I wish I wrote about my community. And even when I think about A Peaceful Road, Dallas Green, it's such an outstanding record. And that too could have been written about my community or like River, you know, uh, by Joni. It's like, I, I think about what that record is about, you know what I mean? And the way she was able to dance around death in a way that was, that still had a sense of pride, you know what I mean? And a sense of joy to it, but never at all compromised the depth and the sorrow of what it was either. It was always in her voice. Like those are, they are all compasses for the way and the direction that I choose to move. Well, let, let's let's talk a little bit about that in in the context of your your own lineage here in Toronto. So, can can we get the headphones back on just for a second? Yes. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think whether you know it or not, and I think you might know it, you're you're part of a, a lineage of black poets in Toronto with a laser focus on their communities. You know, Ian Kamau is one of those poets, someone we've had on the show a lot in the past. He's from the, uh, from the Esplanade, yeah. just minutes away from Regent Park. So, take a listen to what he had to say about you. I think why Mustafa's art is important is because he talks about Regent Park, he talks about his friends and himself and what they're going through in a way that is vulnerable, that you can tell that he cares for them. And as a person who also grew up in downtown Toronto in a neighborhood similar to his and very close to his. Uh, I know that that's the reality of his life that he's trying to communicate in a very particular way. And I think the, the way that he does it and the care and the vulnerability that he shows in doing it is very important um, for people like him and also uh, for the city in general. So what do you, uh, wow. what do you make of, the, what, of Kamau saying there? Oh man, that's beautiful, man. I, Kamau is wonderful. I watched Kamau perform when I was 13 years old. He, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Kamau is wonderful, man. Kamau is wonderful. I, I'm just, it's, 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 I'm always taken aback by people that came before me speaking about the work that I'm doing in a fond way or in any way at all. You know, it's just, it's like, uh, it's so important for me to hear that because I was 14 watching him perform at Harborfront, a poem called Say Joy. And, and he's right. I mean, that's, that's all that it is. It's like it's so important for me to speak about my friends and about myself in a way that feels, you know, freeing, you know. It's all about freedom as well, you know what I mean? The freedom to be able to claim the, your own people as your own. Yeah, and to claim your own identity as your own, and I'm like, and I know that for for so many people, that will that will never be the case, you know, like that, that they will never have that opportunity, and even for my own community, I don't think they even realize the opportunity that we have to tell our own stories and why it's important. But one day, you know, when when we have the archive, the archives. Um, it'll be important, not just for ourselves, but for the people that come after us, you know? Uh, well, and, and you've been generous with your time. I just have a couple more questions for you here. The, the, I want to talk about that idea of, of space in context of last December. So you perform at the legendary Massey Hall, mm -hmm. sold out audience, family, friends, community. It's worth noting that Massey Hall is just minutes away from Regent Park, yet you are one of the few, if not the only, young black musician from your neighborhood to perform on that stage, which again, isn't too far from where you grew up. Absolutely. What did it mean to turn that space into a space for your community, if just for one night? Everything about my experience at Massey Hall felt like a culminating project because for one, Massey Hall is one of my favorite venues in this country, mm -hmm. of course. I watched James Blake perform there many years ago, and I was just a fan, and I was there at the edge of my seat. He's on your record. Exactly. I was there, I was there <laughs> at the end of my edge of my seat, like 
not being able to fathom his talent yeah. as an electronic music producer, as a vocalist, as a pianist. And I was a little disheartened because I, I just didn't believe I could ever reach a place where I could reach people the way he was reaching people in that crowd and the way he was reaching me. And then he went and I was, I prayed that he was going to do it. And he did a cover of A Case of You. And I watched him perform this cover of Joni's song in front of me. And I couldn't believe it because it was so beautiful. I was listening to the lyrics and, you know, his vibrato when he sings, I drew a map of Canada, oh Canada. And years later, I get an opportunity to work with him and he helps produce Stay Alive and he does the last uh, song on my record with me. And I was going to go perform at Massey and across the street from Massey, St. Michael's Hospital, the hospital where Smoke Dog passed, the hospital where Ali passed, the hospital where Yusuf passed. How many worlds have ended in the lobby and in the waiting room of that hospital? My own older brother sitting by his hospital bed after he was shot and uh, watching my parents, you know, struggle to find words for him. Like that, that hospital is one that I don't ever want to return to ever again. And it is legitimately 20 steps away from Masiel. Yeah. And so the night goes on. Bad, Bad, Not Good agrees to be my backing band. It feels like a dream. Uh, police presence, you know, such a violent police presence as well. And days leading up to the show, um, we got a call from Massey Hall that they were flagging the show as a public safety risk and that they wanted to cancel it. And of course, you know, Toronto police were aware that this show was happening for at least two months. And so their effort to reach out to Massey Hall only three days before was not by coincidence, you know. It's, of course, calling three days before would make it impossible for us to reform our plans and make it safe by... Um, the regulations of and by the standards of the Toronto police, but we muscled through and uh, a great thanks to like Jonathan Ramos and Jay Katari who really um, um, worked as hard as they possibly could to make it happen. You said, you said no, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. Yeah. And so like we kind of pushed back and at the end of the day, the board of Massey is not going to like go against the word of the Toronto police, but all that it took was, um, you know, one person, I guess on that board or, or, or one person at Toronto police to just kind of have a conversation. And it was like, and there was a potential of that entire show being canceled. And so even three days before I just, I decided that, I was not even imagining that I would even perform, you know, like I just, I kind of wrote it off. Okay. And uh, I guess two days before it was confirmed that we were going to move forward. And I knew that um, that would come with consequence and cost, you know, and what that cost and consequence would be, I was not aware of. And we arrived there and there were just police surrounding the entire venue, entire facility. And, Surely that was not the case when I was performing with Charlotte Day Wilson the other day. <laughs> Surely it wasn't the case when Dallas played Dallas Green played, I think, the night before. He Absolutely. Was supposed to play the night before. You know, yeah. And, I, you know, to be honest, in the state of this world, like, I'd be afraid of the Gordon Lightfoot crowd. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Personally, like, I, I went to a Bob Dylan concert in New York, and, you know, I was like, you know, I feel a little alien in this crowd. I don't know. I feel like there should be police presence here yeah, as well, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I guess I'm glad that I was able to have that show and prove to the city and prove to the Toronto police that we were able to have a show without any violence. And it was not even about me. 
It wasn't about my community being vulnerable. It wasn't about me being vulnerable. It was about people that were not from the inner city being vulnerable. And that's what frustrated me, what do you mean? that it was a public safety risk. If I did a show in Regent Park, right. it wouldn't have mattered yeah. because the city and this country accounts for the losses of people in communities like mine. Right. They understand that by the end of this year, kids in Regent Park and kids in Rexdale and kids in Malvern and kids in P.O. and in Jungle are going to die. And throughout my years in my community and through all of the deaths that we muscled through as a community, there was only one person who passed, who was murdered, that the police, I felt, cared for. And so every person was murdered and I didn't feel that there were like, you know, really extensive cases being built to finding their murderer. Mm -hmm. But with one person that passed away, there was a $10,000 award mm. for any information on the person who murdered him. Mm. And I thought to myself, why him mm. and not anybody else who was murdered? And so I started to do research. Mm -hmm. And in my research and in my conversations with detectives and with community members, I realized that they thought it was someone who was a massive drug dealer in the city. And in that, I realized that they only wanted to have information on him and have evidence that it was him because they care more about cracking down on capital than they do on the murder of young black boys. Right. And that is their priority is how to like dismantle the way in which people are capitalizing on the selling of drugs, which is of course an important thing, but uh, the people who are passing, right. you know, what about them and the way in which we prioritize and censor, you know what I mean? And I can, them. See, I can see how that makes you feel, think about that when it comes to the concert, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And I guess that was like a side story, but back to the concert is like, I guess when I was performing, I went backstage with my friends and my friend just had like a side bag. And when he was entering, they would never search anyone that is like coming with me. Like this is like my crew. And they decided they wanted to search everyone and open every bag. And my friend was uncomfortable with that. And I said, no, I'm like, you, you shouldn't have to open your bag. And he was like, I'm, he's like, I don't want them searching through my bag. And I'm like, fine. I'm like, just put your bag, uh, put your bag in the car. I'm like, I can just come in. So he puts his bag in the car and they were so paranoid by his decision to put his bag in his car that they sent an email to all the almost 3000 people that were attending and said, there's now a no bag policy for everyone attending this show. Yeah, I heard that. So at 2 PM that day, every single person, because we entered the venue at one o'clock for um, for a sound check yeah. and by 2 p.m. an email was sent to every single person attending the show telling them they could not bring bags into the venue and I said and what is that telling you know what I mean the city what is that telling the audience that is coming to see me are they meant to fear me are they meant to fear the people that are alongside them and how is it that I'm able to create a safe communal vulnerable and trusted space when all of these systems are working to make it alien and make it like uh, impossible to exist in without an element of fear. And as I walked out on that stage, I can see the lights outside of the venue flickering against the stained glass, you know? And it took me a moment to realize that these are police lights and the police lights were on, you know? and. Uh, and I guess all of the worlds that have haunted me and that have celebrated me 
all collided in that evening. And I guess it was essential for the community and for the city to see that and to feel that. How do you perform? Like, how did you? It was difficult, but like, you know, I guess having Bad Bad, like, you know, there's such wonderful musicians yeah. and thinking about the songs and thinking about the songwriting yeah. and thinking about what that meant to me yeah. more than anything else. Yeah. That's what was important. I thought about Ali's mom being in the crowd. She was. You know, and, and, and as I performed Ali, I thought about her and I thought about her alone. And I thought, this is my first time performing this song for her. This is for her. Yeah. I thought about the friends that I had projected on the wall behind me. And all that I was in that evening was a vessel. I was a vessel for stories that were not mine. I was a vessel for, you know, for emotions that were not felt. And I was a vessel for turmoil that was clearly unresolved. The ones that were directly behind that wall and the ones that have been lingering for many years and the ones that were left in the hospital across that street. Um, well, let me, let me close off this way because it's been great talking to you. It's a pleasure. It's a joy to have you in. No, that's a joy to be here. Um, so we, if, we, if we go right back to the very beginning, right? So for a decade, as I mentioned at the very beginning, you, you've grown up in the eye of, of the media young child poet, 11 years old, who I have recordings of, <laughs> advocate for your community, co-signs from the likes of Drake and The Weeknd, big hit song in the States, finally releasing your debut album. What's a, a lesson that you've learned along the way that's stuck with you? I saved a hard one for the last one. Before I say that, as I actually don't consider One Smoke Rises as an album, you know. What do you call it? I, I I just didn't want to call it an EP because like all of these titles are a little odd, all, yeah. you know, anyway. But like, it's like I'm working on my debut album now, you know. You don't I'm, consider it an album? I consider it a project. I think that for me, like we all have our own understandings of what projects and albums and EPs are. But like, I only discuss death on this record. It was only about loss. Right. And I think that the record that I'm working on now is a record that, covers so much of what I experienced, not only in Regent Park, but um, the way in which I understand the world, you know? God and romance and death and grief and afterlife and all of um, my different ideas and the nuance. You know, I think that because I was talking about, you know, viol violence and death, I was not able to explore nuance in the way that I wanted to. And I think that the album that I'm working on now feels like one because that's uh, that's what I'm able to explore, and I'm able to explore the range of 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 who I am and what I am. Cool. But with the lesson, yeah, like what have you learned? What have I learned? What have I learned? There's so much that I learned. And you said, is it in regards to one thing or just like? Well, you know what? Like, it's just. I just think that like it's it's within my tendency and the tendency of p people who work in jobs like me to see your story as a story mm -hmm, absolutely, and not real life. So what I want to know is when you go through it in real life, what do you learn? What I learned is that people will hold you accountable to what you shame yourself for. People will hold you accountable for what you shame yourself for. And what I mean by that, yeah, I think that's, that's what I'm trying to say, that people will hold you accountable for what you choose to shame yourself for. And I realized that whatever it is, if I hold it passionately and for dear life, like my life depends on it, and I'm not ashamed of it, then people will reflect that, you know? But the shame that I feel and the hesitation, all of that is a thing that will be reflected as well. Yeah. That in a lot of ways, I guess like, you know, like a more simple way of saying it is that like my audience and my community and the people that surround me, like they will reflect me. And they do reflect me. 
And I never realized that the people that would resent me the most for the journey that I'm going on would be would be people that would that looked just like me yeah. and that had the very experience that I had. Yeah. A black Muslim person from an inner city community. Like I realized that most times the greatest critiques that I get are for people that share all those experiences. But that's because they have a different lived experience with Islam and with the hood and with blackness. And for me, all that I can do is be the greatest form of a reflection that I can be. And I always think about that, you know, how much I am a mirror to other people and how in a lot of ways the people before me are mirrors too, you know. And uh, I'm just trying to like master the reflection, not to say that I want it to be perfect, but I want it to be the most honest account of who I am. So I'm not trying to reflect an ideal or a life that is not mine, you know, or like reflect a purity that I actually can't really subscribe to because I'm, because I'm constantly falling. And so I want to reflect all my flaws, you know what I mean? And all my truths and all my joys, because that's what I want to be. I want to be an honest artist. And I don't want people to look at me and be like, oh, he was, a, he was such a great person more than I want them to think of me as a sincere person. Yeah. And that sincerity comes from me thinking about my audience as, and myself as, as a mirror. Yeah, greatness is a trap. Trap. Um, thanks for coming in. Thank you so much for having me.